so it's been another slow week. I've been trying to get a lot done in the background, but um, I thought I would update y'all as to proof that I was right about yet another aspect of the facial recognition surveillance state they're building. Um, and in this particular instance, the thing that I said was that they were going to use contact-free um, as their way to sort of muscle things through. Um, and how the technology that they used uh, during the pandemic would be used after the pandemic. And that the, really the pandemic was like an excuse to, you know, set up a bunch of the kinds of tech that they've been wanting to set up for a long time now. And I thought a, a good example of this would be um, the TSA demanding biometric facial recognition ID as the basis for your ability to fly. Um, and the, the, it's, it's, it's hilarious that they're calling it clear for reasons that I'll go over a little bit later in the video. But um, I just, you know, Jesse Smith um, cross-posted to activist post, uh, wrote, What began as a limited facial recognition pilot at Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport in Washington, D.C. during the COVID-19 pandemic has now spread to other airports across the USA. According to the Washington Post, the TSA is expanding plans to launch biometric identity capture using facial recognition at 16 major airports. Here's more on this story. Quote, Next time you're at airport security, get ready to look straight into a camera. The TSA wants to analyze your face. The TSA has been quietly testing controversial facial recognition technology for passenger screening at 16 major domestic airports from Washington to Los Angeles and hopes to expand it across the United States as soon as next year. Kiosks with cameras are doing a job that used to be completed by humans, checking the photos on travelers' IDs to make sure they're not imposters. Very sus. The TSA says facial recognition, which has been banned by cities such as San Francisco, helps improve security and possibly also efficiency. But it's also bring, bringing an unproven tech with civil rights ramifications we still just don't understand to one of the most stressful parts of travel. No, you don't have to participate in facial recognition at the airport. Whether you'll feel like you have a real choice is a separate question. So that's a Washington Post article. Um, and it basically goes on to say that people are going to be cajoled into this, right? So that is a problem. For any one of you who has been um, paying attention to any of this sort of thing, um, and for those of you who have been following my content for a while, you know that facial recognition is the basis for the modern security, surveillance, uh, and intelligence industrial complex, and the mark of the beast that they're calling, um, you know, ID2020, you know, Open ID Alliance, FIDO, you know, whatever, whatever they want to call it in this particular moment, but linked to CBDC, which is a universally monitorable um, one-way mirror of a blockchain that uh, the U.S. government can see everything, and you can't see anything. So basically, it's a universal uh, surveillance of all you do, your entire activities, like everywhere you appear with your face in public, your purchases, your dreams, your hopes, your familial connections, all connected to this thing that's connected to your face. Now, um, this... TSA thing is proof positive of something that I've been saying for a while now, and I'll get into that a little later, but that they're going to use their COVID-era policies to muscle through this sort of thing. 
And I'm not one of these YouTubers that's going to fucking hush it. I'm not going to call it scary beer flu. I'm, I'm not going to mince my words. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the straight dope, yo, which is that these things are being used to surveil you and the excuse for their existence and widespread adoption is literally COVID, a thing that's endemic, a thing that Fauci said that we were all going to get. And, you know, it was never really about that with all this contact-free noise. It was about control. It was about regulatory capture. It was about getting people on board with the new normal and the Great Reset. Making sure people shop at the stores uh, run by your biggest campaign donors. Um, making sure that people shop at the mega corporate stores who will comply with all regulations and snitch on people and join in the system that will prevent them from engaging with the economy if they don't uh, comply with state orders. That's what this has always been about. And, um, you know, just to hammer it home a little bit here about the, the, the dangers of facial recognition, um, there's, a, there's a great article on CODA, uh, and y'all can check this out too. Um, and it's as anxiety about crime peaks, U.S. cities look to surveillance tech, but does it actually work? And it talks about how, like, the, uh, the crime spikes last year caused uh, a rise in tensions and people being like, oh, yeah, you know, maybe we should uh, introduce Orwellian fucking technology. But uh, <laughs> the feeling does not mean that the facts change. And the fact is that this right here, this fucking spider of Orwellian monstrosity is evil. Okay. So, um, national crime data reveals a complex picture. The murder rate spiked in 21, reaching its highest point in nearly 25 years, but now appears to be decreasing, with homicides in major cities down by nearly 5% in 2022. All other kinds of violent crime have held steady or dropped since 2019, according to Pew, and cities' experience with violent crime are not uniform. As of November 2022... Murders have increased by nearly 30% in New Orleans and Charlotte compared to the same time period in 2021 and decreased in others, including San Francisco and Oakland, where they banned facial recognition. Despite San Francisco's pioneering ban on the use of facial recognition technology, and here's the catch, in September 2022, the city's Board of Supervisors passed a policy that will allow law enforcement to access the video footage of a private security cameras in real time. During a 15-month pilot phase, San Francisco police will be able to view up to 24 hours of live video footage from private surveillance cameras during criminal investigations and large public events. Those of you who have been following my content for a bit know that, uh, that one of the things that I've been talking about has been the Ukraine thing, where they literally gave access to a bunch of Amazon Ring doorbells uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and, like, a bunch of these Ukrainians had just universal access, and they could just, with the flick of a switch and the right email address, access your Ring door camera. Um, but it's not just that. It's also the police themselves, because these doorbell uh, cameras have been literally turned into a giant dragnet police surveillance statism apparatus. They can just access them when they want. And uh, San Francisco is looking to broaden that uh, by just saying, yeah, private security cameras, give us that footage. Um, everywhere that has cameras is now being weaponized against the privacy of the people. Um, and just to be clear, that's evil. Um, before we move on, though, this is brought to you by Brushfire 2048, a sequel to a book by a guy who's sponsored my content before. 
Um, and it's about the way things are shortly in 2048. And um, if you want a dystopian uh, thriller to send to your conspiracy theorist friends this Christmas, feel free to hit up that up with the link in the description. It's also brought to you by Liberty Professionals, who will uh, help you secure your home or small business. It's run by a residential security expert who's also an ACES board-certified physical security professional. The firm also serves legal papers in Texas. Contact them for more information. Uh, and also, by the way, they specialize, and this is important to this video, in residential security and will help you secure your home through either a brief consultation or through assessment. Bug sweeps to detect hidden video and audio recording devices are also available. They will teach you what the alarm companies, fire departments, and police agencies will not. They also do private consultations to secure your home, even if you're not in Texas. So uh, if you want to support some, a longtime supporter of the show and support this show as well by being one of the reasons that I can keep doing this, um, feel free to hit him up with the links in the description. Contact them today to improve your property's physical security and peace of mind. Um, and it's, it's appropriate that, that this content is sponsored by that. Because in a letter to city officials, um, <laughs> a coalition opposing the ordinance, including the ACLU of NorCal and the San Francisco Public Defender's Office, argued the proposal massively expands police surveillance and could give officers the ability to surveil any large gathering of people in San Francisco, including the crowds that gather for the Pride Parade, street markets, and other political and civic events. The EFF, Matthew Garig Gorilla? I think that's how you say that, described the board's decision as an attempt to put voters at ease that something, anything, is being done about crime. These San Francisco's legislators are not alone. Their decision reflects a broader trend playing out in left-leaning cities nationwide. I don't buy that they're left-leaning, by the way, especially if they're giving state capitalists the ability to surveil everything without uh, punity. Like, that's not, that's not communism. It's just fucking fascism, the way, the way it's been for a long time. So I do contest that point in this article. Like, left authoritarian exists, but this isn't that. Just gonna say that. Uh, but these cities also risk entrenching a permanent surveillance infrastructure that may be dis difficult to dismantle down the road. Quote, the history of surveillance suggests that it's not easy to put the genie back in the bottle, argues Rosenberg. So basically, that's what I've been saying, that all of this surveillance tech built around COVID is now being deployed everywhere as a as like they, they used it as an excuse. COVID was always an excuse to deploy this shit everywhere. And it's not going to be easy to undeploy because they're not going to do it. They're not interested in doing that. Once once you give these people power, it's once you give a mouse a cookie. One of the most high-profile examples of this dynamic comes out of New Orleans, where lawmakers are poised to expand police surveillance less than two years after a pa passing a sweep sweeping facial recognition ban. In July, they voted to allow the city police departments to request access to facial recognition technology from the Louisiana State Analytical Infusion Exchange, which analyzes data for police to investigate certain kinds of crimes, including rape, murder, carjacking, robbery, and purse snatching. The ordinance passed amid a surge in violent crime in Nolens, not seen since the mid-1990s. In early July, just weeks before the city council approved the policy, Nolens reportedly had the highest murder rate in the nation. Supporters of the measure, including the city's mayor, claimed that it would help police rein in crime by helping officers track down perpetrators more effectively. This raises a critical question, though. Do these tools actually fucking help reduce or solve crimes? As one city council member who voted against the New Orleans policy pointed out, the argument was not backed up by empirical evidence. During a hearing on the vote, an official with the police department admitted that he had no information about how frequently the department used facial rec recognition before it was banned in 2020 and whether its use had led to any arrests or convictions. Quote, 
You have no data sitting here today telling me that this actually works, that it leads to arrest admissions or clearances, a council member Leslie Harris said. The Louisiana chapter of the ACLU blasted the council's decision to expand racist technologies, highlighting research that has found that facial recognition disproportionately misidentifies women and people of color. A, tw a 2019 federal study found that the majority of facial recognition systems are biased, misidentifying black and Asian faces significantly higher rates than their white counterparts. These flawed matches have real-world consequences. At least three black men in the U.S. have been wrongfully arrested after facial recognition software incorrectly identified them for crimes they did not commit. Elsewhere, cities are embracing a controversial gunshot detection surveillance technology that a study from the Northwestern School of Law found to be inaccurate, expensive, and dangerous, sending police on unfounded deployments in predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods. The technology, ShotSpotter, used as a system of the discrete acoustic sensors to identify the location of gunshots and then send an alert to police, who can then decide to send an officer to the scene of the alleged crime. So I'll just take a brief moment to go over that. This is from uh, STOP, the Surveillance uh, Technology Opposition Project. I don't know. I, I, I forget exactly what it stands for, but it's, uh, it says, Once installed, ShotSpotter sensors record audio 24-7, storing recordings for 30 hours, down from 72 hours, until they are overwritten on a rolling basis. The eavesdropping devices record anything they hear including conversations conducted at normal volume up to 50 feet away, according to ShotSpotter's own engineer when testifying under oath. Once recorded, those conversations could be searched manually and preserved for later use. There are at least two cases of ShotSpotter voice recordings being used in court. In 07, a California court allowed a voice recording captured by ShotSpotter as evidence in a murder trial. In 2012, a Massachusetts court ruled that ShotSpotter's recording of a conversation violated the Massachusetts Wiretap Act. Like many states, Massachusetts wiretapping ban goes beyond tapping phone lines and other communication platforms, also outlying bugging locations with secret microphones. Instead of answering concerns around sensors' eavesdropping capabilities, ShotSpotter first claimed that its sensors cannot record conversations. It later admitted the risk and in 2019 apparently agreed to external auditors' recommendations that it deny or challenge police demands for censor audio. Promises aside, however, nothing appears to stop ShotSpotter from searching, retrieving, and sharing audio stored for 30 hours on its sensors or from sharing the audio stored longer on its servers. You know when they want to, you know, make a, a, a joke or something about, like, the dystopian future where, yeah, you know, they, they've got these bots that just fly around and they can hear everything you say, man. Well, they don't need them to fly around. They've got them stationed everywhere and everywhere more is going to get them. And they just dot cities with these primarily in uh, easily exploitable neighborhoods where they have less money to fight things legally. So that they can go in and milk to the masses, get more prisoners for the prison industrial complex, and surveil us all for dissent against their system, which is slowly getting worse and worse. And it's evil, but it's still being done. Um, and I've talked about ShotSpotter before. Subscribe if you ain't already, because I've talked about all of this stuff before, but you know, I figured it was it was it was a good thing to bring up what ShotSpotter can do, because the contract, the firm has contracts in over 120 cities nationally, some of which have come under fire for pouring millions into a technology that critics say is error prone and ineffective. It contests claims of inaccuracy, saying the technology has a 97% accuracy rate. But a 2021 analysis of the Chicago Police Department's use of ShotSpotter by the city's Office of Inspector General found that just 9% of alerts were linked to gun-related crimes. 9 fucking percent! 
Not even 10%, not even a dime on the dollar of these were even related to gun-related crimes. The rest of them are just them eavesdropping on you, listening to every single conversation you say that's of any volume at all, with all their, like, high-tech acoustic sensors. They can hear you talking to your family right now. They can hear you tucking your kid in. They are listening to you right fucking now. And they want more facial recognition technology so that they can know when you leave your house and what you do while you're out. All nice and tracked by your contact-free apps on your phone, which, by the way, Spokane is transitioning off of using paper money and things like that for their buses, too. So now we're being transitioned onto using phone apps to ride public transit. It's fucking... It's so... I was right, you know? Um, but just figured I would stop and talk about that for a second. A recent class action lawsuit filed by the MacArthur Justice Center at Northwestern University alleged that the city has intentionally deployed ShotSpotter along stark racial lines and uses ShotSpotter to target black and Latinx people. Don't say Latinx, that's garbage. But, despite such criticisms about the technology and its impact on policing, cities are still using it. Earlier this month, the Detroit City Council ended a months-long divisive debate about whether to expand ShotSpotter when it approved a $7 million contract to deploy the system to 10 new neighborhoods in the city. Detroit's decision came just days after Cleveland City Council voted to quadruple the size of ShotSpotter's current use area. Other cities that have recently moved to expand or renew contracts include Sacramento, Houston, and Chi-Town. And so, the overall picture, says uh, Albert Fox Kahn, and founder of executive tech director of the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, that's what it was, is in New York, is one of surveillance opportunism in which technology c companies are pitching surveillance systems to lawmakers and law enforcement agencies seeking to quell concerns about public safety. To promote these technologies, Fox Kahn added, some public officials have positioned the expansion of surveillance in cities as a more humane alternative to traditional policing. Grigley of the EFF explained, Surveillance doesn't come without the iron fist of the police department. Because even if they capture something on surveillance and they want to arrest a person, that person is not going to be arrested by a camera. They're going to be arrested by a person with a nightstick and can cuffs and a gun. At the end of the day, this trend pushes them toward a vision of citywide surveillance favored by some of the world's most authoritarian regimes. Now, San Francisco's facial recognition ban remains intact, but hey, they just uh, allowed people to, uh, you know, police to attach weapons to robots so that they can remote control kill people if they want. Uh, so that's awesome. Um, and while I'm talking about all of this, why don't we talk about what facial recognition has been doing? Because Amazon uh, is installing palm scanning technology to, like, concession stands in the Seattle area, getting people nice and bubbly used to it so that they can get used to scanning their hand. Keep in mind, if it's like this, it's not fascism. It's, it's this that's fascism. You have to have it angled at, like, 45 degrees. Um, <laughs> and it's all based on climate pledge. So it's like, let's go green. Let's not, let's not have contact. Contact is bad. And it's biometric technology, which means that they're starting with your palm scan or your face scan, just like I said they would. Forbes is saying that contactless payment is an evolving technology and its potential uses are still being discovered. Fusions of the above-mentioned implementations are already being created and enacted. For example, the first biometric payment cards are now available, credit and debit cards featuring a fingerprint scanner to combine the comfort of a card with the security of mobile apps. 
Services like Revolut and Cash App are now offering services sim similar to Google and Apple Pay, while offering easier ways to transfer money between currencies and between people. <laughs> so Forbes is hard selling it, and while Forbes and uh, and Amazon are hard selling this, Mastercard launched in May tech that lets you pay with your face or your hand in stores. Exactly what I've been talking about for fucking ever, and. For those of you who've been following me, you know that I talked about uh, Fido, which is an alliance between Google, Microsoft, Visa, Yubico, MasterCard, and a bunch of uh, other sort of like, you know, uh, like identity coalescing organizations and applications designed to make things so, so much simpler. Yeah, simpler and less free. Because, as I said nearly three years ago, the more this facial recognition tech expands, the closer we get to Clearview. Because the New York Times was talking about how Clearview uh, was uh, Hon, Hon Tan Tot's greatest hits, which included an obscure iPhone game and an app that let people put Donald Trump's distinctive yellow hair on their own photos. And so I said, so there you go. Another example of a guy running a fun app who later turns out to want to use your photos for nefarious purposes. The last time it happened, it was with FaceApp. And since the people behind that were Russian, everyone freaked out. I reckon Australians can't abuse your data, though. Nah, no way. The piece goes on to say his tiny company, Clearview AI, devised a groundbreaking facial recognition app. You can take a picture of a person, upload it to and get to see public photos of that person, along with links to where those photos appeared. The system, whose backbone is a database of more than 3 billion images that Clearview claims to have scraped from Facebook, YouTube, Venmo, and millions of other websites, goes far beyond anything ever constructed by the U.S. government or Silicon Valley giants. You hear that? Millions of other sites. It goes on to say that more than 600 Leo agencies already use it, and then reveals something chilling. The app has buried in its code a way to link the, this to AR glasses and other smart vision tech, just like the Chinese 5G surveillance state. <laughs> the article then goes on to make some extraordinary claims. Not only does he want it everywhere, but this tech has been used by Leos since 2017 under the name Smart Checker. When they rebranded, they saw startup capital from Peter Thiel, noted member of the Bilderberg Steering Committee. Very interesting, considering that in 2019, Bilderberg's agenda included the weaponization of social media, the ethics of AI, and China as key talking points. <laughs> so, I went on to discuss that this is exactly what's been doing there. That uh, the 5G dragnet is here, exactly the one... That, uh, that Corbett and co. were warning about, and that this was being built uh, in order to enable people like fucking Homeland Security to scan people's faces and that sort of thing, right? So I was right this whole fucking time. Um, and just to hammer it home, you know, after I show off that this was posted in January 20, uh, 23rd, 2020, that it was posted that fucking long ago, nearly three fucking years ago. Let's talk about something that was also posted nearly three fucking years ago. I said that recently on both my website and YouTube, I went over Clearview, a shady company that allows something as simple as taking a photo of someone to be the basis for a mass search of public info. This functionality has been used in hundreds of Leo departments and thousands of investigations and continues to this day to be used. They take a picture of you, and it immediately matches to your social profile, all usernames, home addresses, phone numbers, and more. <clears throat> What's worse, buried in its code is the ability to connect to augmented reality glasses and seamlessly deliver this info in a video game-style cyberpunk-looking readout. China is already implementing this along with the kind of infrastructural control that will give Bloom's smart city program they call Central Operating System from Ubisoft's watchdogs a run for its money. <laughs> <laughs> universal monitoring, universal control, and access to all accounts. 
make that a fun game to play from a decided unrealistic hacker's POV, but a terrible world to actually live in. But China has made it real and wants you to know about it, which why they they're which is why their nationalized telecom company put out a propaganda video detailing how the state could bend a whole city to their wheel well just to find one person. And the basis of that, it's coming here. It Clearview presents that clear and present danger to our liberty and privacy, a universal X key score that more than just an SA can and regularly do access, and not for nothing, that additional airport screening is facial recognition because it's more sanitary to prevent cooties. Wow, just like I started this whole thing saying that the airport screening and a bunch of other COVID era policies would be kept and held over so that they could continue to use it to this day. Still not convinced? You know how every YouTuber and other content creator you know is sponsored by Bill Gates recently? That happened, by the way. You can look up that trend in around the time I wrote this article. Uh, one of the guys behind Event 201, you know, how he wants to seem all human and keeps on coming onto people's channels and sites. Funny it's happening right now, right before he stepped down from Microsoft's board. I mean, he's 64 with a net worth of $96 million, so it makes sense for him to retire now, right? Enter Mark Zuckerberg and his wife Priscilla Chan throwing $25 million behind an effort to find a drug cure. The Chan-Zuckerberg Initiative, a totally not a tax write-off philanthropy organization, is throwing that money at the Gates Foundation and their COVID-19 Therapeutics Accelerator effort. And that Zuck cash combined with a $50 million upfront investment from the Gates themselves and other philanthropic donations brings their total funds now uh, to $125 million. Mark Sussman, current head of the foundation, says we believe we can help by partnering with private and philanthropic enterprises to lower the financial risk and technical barriers for biotech and pharmaceutical companies developing antivirals for COVID-19. So what else has Gates been up to? Well, for two years now, Microsoft has been the founding partner to another organization, which goes by the name ID2020. Peggy Johnson, Executive VP De Business Development Microsoft Corporation, has this to say about the partnership. Closing the identity gap is an enormous challenge. It will take the work of many committed people and organizations coming together across different geographies, sectors, and technologies. But it's exciting to Im imagine a world where safe and secure digital identities are possible, providing everyone with an essential building block to every right and opportunity they deserve. So how does she plan on closing that gap? And what is ID2020? It's a universal ID system they've been building for years. The official website says it will live with you from life to death. And that it will be accessible anywhere you happen to be through multiple methods. They bemoaned that 1.1 billion people worldwide live without a digital ID. And that identity is neither portable nor persistent. They couch this in human rights, essential services, economic opportunity, assisting those in need, gender equality, and global development. They cite a 2015 UN declaration that they'd provide legal identity for all, including birth re registration by 2030, and directly state the rapid proliferation of smart devices globally, combined with ever-increasing computing power and rapidly expanding broadband coverage, enables new methods of registration and facility facilitates ongoing interaction between individuals and their identity data. They say, new technologies including blockchain, when used in conjunction with long-proven technologies such as biometrics, now make it possible for all people to have access to a safe, versatile, and verifiable and persistent form of identity. Are you seeing the red flags? Good. It gets worse. By looking over their technical requirements, they demand that the solutions bearing the ID2020 mark of certifications have both offline and online capability, resilience, long-term usability, cost-effectiveness, ease of use, and ease of implementation on the part of both end-user inf and information recipient. It's a long document, but suffice it to say, it's a lot of info to basically say, we're scanning you everywhere you go. <laughs> But how to implement such a sweeping change? Well, one of the organizations on the advisory uh, board of ID2020 is Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, 
CEO of Gavi, Dr. Seth Berkley, sits on their executive board. On mandatory vaccines, Gavi is on record saying, I personally think that it's a good strategy, and bemoaned people having problems with government as part of the misinformed masses. As to strategy, Gavi is on record talking about their strategy in implementing mandatory vax. If you go in and say, we the government are going to tell you what to do, I think that makes it challenging. If you say, we are trying to pass laws that protect the population, think about wearing seatbelts or wearing a motorcycle helmet or not smoking in public places. These were all regulations that were about protecting the population. It needs to be seen like that. So how do you get the people on the side of such an invasion? Well, it starts with kids. And I went over the fact that they were adding those marks to kids, that sort of thing. Uh, tattoos, marks of the beast. A lot like Black Mirror's Mark Angel. You know? I just, you know, I said it. I've been saying this. That they were going to do this forever ago, nearly three years now, and I just wanted to remind people of that. Because it's not gone, it's still here, and it's still a problem, and it's evil. And they don't care how many minorities get unlawfully and unethically and unreasonably detained, arrested, their lives destroyed. They don't care how many private citizens lose all their privacy because they're eavesdropping on you wherever you go and uh, because they're monitoring you by your face wherever you go, even if you carry no technology on you at all. They want this to seem like it's for your health and your safety and they wanted to muscle it through by contact free. But that's exactly what I said they would do. And now every single Orwellian thing that I said that they were going to have, they have it now! And they're expanding it! And it's getting worse! And countries are being forced onto the CBDC, and the U.S. is running their pilot program for it. As anybody who follows me and subscribes to this channel, which you should do, by the way, and like the video, a comment, and spam this to your friends, knows that they've been expanding this technology, that this has been in the works, and that they're running a pilot program right now in New York City for the CBDC, the thing that I said they were going to have years ago. The time to say no is now. And I just thought I would tell everybody that this has been going on for a long enough time that the time to say no was years ago. But at least it's now. You can at least say no now. Before this is fully implemented. I mean, you could have said no years and years ago, but so many people were calling me a grandma killing, puppy hating, you know, child murdering, insane tinfoiler conspiracy theorist, misinformation peddler, anti-vax, kill him, anti-science, vax hesitant. Ugh! Yeah, I'm hesitant, all right, bitch. Because the system being built around this technology is evil. And if I'm not even allowed to hesitate, yeah, I'm gonna be angry enough to say something about it. Because I'm going to do a whole lot more than hesitate if they try to force this on me. And so should you. So I just thought I'd tell people that all of that is just another in a laundry list of reasons that we need to smash the fucking state.